Oh, can you switch, can, uh, Gian, with me? Yep, sorry. All right, last checkup. Oh, I'm going to jump in, guys. All right. Um, hello, everybody. Let's see how many people are here. We got 23 people in right now. So let's just uh, wait for uh, the last wave to come in. Um, so everybody that uh, are attending the uh, this podcast right now, just say a big hello in the chat box right here on the right. I'll do. I'll be the first one to do it. You can uh, talk in French or English. We are uh, bilingual here, so feel free to use any language between French and English, please. I'm not that good in Spanish. Um, still a course that I'm uh, not attending to, so I'm going to try to improve my uh, skills in Spanish. Um, Gian, she's with us. Uh, she's just, uh, we are having like uh, a maximum of three webcam uh, on at the same time. So, Gian, can you say hello to, hello to us? Hello. So, there you go, guys. <laughs> We're going to hear her. We're going to switch me and Gian from uh, uh, camera to another camera. So, you'll see a lot of uh, camera movements. But, uh, yeah, that's how it's, um, this podcast will go. I uh, hope you guys are excited. We have two guests with us today. Um, I'll uh, do the presentation in a second, but just before we start, this is the third part of uh, concussion. So if you guys didn't see our two uh, first videos, they are on YouTube. So you guys can go on YouTube and, and watch them, not now, um, later on. But uh, you can watch part one and part two. It doesn't matter if you didn't see these two parts because uh, it doesn't have um, like a direct link with the third podcast. It's just uh, we're going to talk about uh, concussion, obviously, TBI, and uh, they're gonna. We got two experts that gonna will share with us their knowledge into uh, in that on that subject. So, um, if you want to learn more about concussion and TBI that we didn't cover today, uh, you might find it in our two parts of uh, the, the concussion that we did um, in the past month. Um, so it's gonna be on YouTube, uh, the national, the CFMWS uh, YouTube page. They will. Uh, they said to me they will upload the videos on their YouTube channel. Um, meanwhile, during that time, if you want to go see uh, the videos, it's gonna be on my personal YouTube page. So you just write my name down, Francis Fullwood on YouTube, and you will find all the videos that me and Gian have been doing since the beginning of COVID. Um, technically, that's what we've been doing uh, with the COVID. We had changed a little bit of uh, way of working. So, um, yeah, I hope you guys are going to enjoy all the podcasts that we did so far. But uh, let's uh, do this one today and see how it goes to you. Also, if you guys have any questions during the podcast, um, feel free to just put it in the chat um, and we will answer them uh, at the end of the podcast. Uh, I say we, it's going to be Ryan and Adrian. Um, they are the expert we uh, we're gonna host and uh, yeah feel free to ask you your question any kind of question um, to them and uh, we will be uh, more than happy to answer the questions also if you're not shy and you want to come here on camera and ask the question directly to them that is also possible so just uh, set in in the chat and we'll invite you to come uh, live and ask your question directly to them so it can be in both language don't worry about it um yeah i'm bilingual and gm she's bilingual i don't know for you ryan are you bilingual yeah i'm pretty I'm pretty good it's pretty story. good in both language there you go so you guys are really welcome to ask a question i see a lot of uh, french people in the chat so feel free to ask a question directly um oh we just lost ryan um <laughs> So uh, enough said. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's start that podcast. So I would like to welcome our two special guests today, um, Ryan uh, Carey, uh, Ryan Carey, who's uh, was draft fourth overall in the CFL, uh, and he played in the CFL from '94 to '98 with two teams, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Yeah, that was in the time when uh, uh, the CFL had two teams with the same name. Just uh, a refresh. Um, and um, 
Also, he was uh, with the military, with the RCR, uh, the Canadian Forces. So he was a captain and uh, he's retired today. And now he works with Adrian for the same organization. And our second ga- guest today, it's Adrienne Crapton. Uh, she's, uh, she did her bachelor degree in kinesiology, her master degree in human kin- kinetics. And now she's finishing her PhD into a really specific title. Let me read that. In TBI concussion rehabilitation, focusing on the visual and vestibular impairments that occur following these injuries. Did I get that right, Adrian? You nailed it. Oh, God, I was stressed. Um, <laughs> and she's also a former hockey player for uh, McGill University, and she was a defense player. So, um, and she also had an ender, ending career concussion. So we're going to talk more about that. But welcome to both of you guys. Thank you. How is you guys? How are you guys doing? Good. Good. Happy to be here. They're both uh, in Montreal right now, so uh, Adrian was showing me the cloud that you guys had yesterday. It was pretty scary. I really hope that uh, you guys don't have that kind of weather now. Um, but yeah, um, so these two uh, special guests work for an organization that's called the Concussion Legacy Foundation Canada. So let's talk about this. Let's start with the first question. What is your role? What is the role of that organization? You want me to take this one, Ryan? Uh, go for it. Ladies first. Sure. I'll start it off. Well, essentially, we just really support the study of, uh, of brain injuries and really try to support advances in prevention and treatment and diagnosis. So wherever we can, wherever there needs to be an advance, um, the Concussion Legacy Foundation is trying to tap into all of its resources and, and create opportunities to support scientific advances in that. And how do you guys receive the funding? Like, how does it work? Like, uh, it can happen through um, through private donations, but it can also happen often through government funding uh, or government grants. So there's really a miscellaneous ways that that we can receive that funding. Cool. Yeah, and the way I, the way I see the organization, um, you know, there's certainly uh, really smart people involved, like Adrian, and then there's people like me that have bashed their head around most of their life and I'm not trying to look like a tough guy I lost my false tooth so if anyone's wondering <laughs> it, 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 it's horrible to try to speak with it but so I think it's where the science where the rubber meets the road it's where the science meets the advocacy and someone like me who's played football and who's been in the military and uh, the, the science is behind because that's the reality um, it's like you know when we knew smoking was bad um, but people are saying, look, this is bad. And the smoking companies were saying, yeah, but you can't, you haven't proven it yet. You know, it, the science came along obviously with smoking. Um, but it's similar with head injury. There are some deniers out there. There's some people say, well, really, are you sure that it's a problem? Some people have concussions and they don't experience mental health disorders or they don't have these problems. And well, you know what? Some people smoke and they remain healthy too, but that doesn't mean it's a good thing. It's, it's about advocacy. And about bringing the science you know up to the level that it needs to be and and i think that combination is what you know i'm there as a a military um advocate and a uh and and to give the military perspective and trying to connect the concussion legacy foundation with project enlist with um, organizations that are government that are non-government and really get that veteran and current serving member uh involved uh, within the organization as well so that's one of the success that uh, this organization have right now, like the big mix of people who works among the organization. Do you guys have any other success that you you want to share with us? Like what kind of I know, Adrian, you're doing your Ph.D. and this organization is kind of like helping you doing it. Am I correct? Um, well, there's three of us who are just finishing up PhDs in the organization, and uh, we're doing this at the same time because we we love kind of having having a few things on the go. Um, but it's also really important to be working alongside a foundation such as this because, as Ryan mentioned, it's important to have kind of the academic, the research-based mindset, but also, you know, the everyday you know, people who are in it, people who are who were in high risk groups, who can bring that perspective, 
and, and ensure that we can actually expand our horizons and make sure that we're addressing everything that needs to be addressed and touching upon it. It gives us ideas for, for where we can kind of allocate resources, where we can, you know, kind of tunnel vision in on and where, you know, we might have more importance. So certain points are more important than others, just need to be prioritized because there's so many things to touch on, right? Well, for sure. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you wanted to say? No, I was just going to say, so there's there's many different successes. You know, we have programs out in the community to help educate the community, uh, both through, yes, advocacy, but also education um, in different groups of people. So we have a pretty wide reach around schools and universities alike. Uh, things like Team Up, Speak Up, so that's really teaching people to change the stigma, like destigmatize um, talking about concussions and speaking up when you do have one. Things like that are really important to just change the culture of uh, sports, for example, or certain groups that may, um, that may promote uh, hiding concussions or not talking about them or not you know, seeking out the right resources when you have one. So that's a really important program, and, and we have a few more like that and then uh ryan touched on the brain banks yeah. right so the brain banks are huge because that's what's going to advance some research right yeah and i think the team up speak up program <clears throat> is, is is fantastic because um the chances are of you self-reporting a concussion are low why because you have a concussion and most people that get a concussion are probably just trying to right themselves and get themselves, you know, sorted out again. So that team up speak up allows, um, you know, it, it, it allows the group to be responsible. For example, in the NFL, they, they, they re recognize that they can't see all the head injuries. So now they have spotters in the booth with, with binoculars because sometimes a physiotherapist is working with the player and someone gets a knock on the head. So it, it's, it's, not it's putting the onus on all of us because the word responsibility means we have an ability to respond and what is that ability hey look out for each other and in the military it's all about that if you have a fire team partner and you're responsible for each other and if you can if you can you know uh, bring that into the sporting world uh, it's kind of already ingrained in us in the military but this isn't this isn't about litigation this isn't about going out and trying to get something it's about hey look at this is this is a serious topic that we need to discuss um and and this is this is a good avenue to discuss it i mean recently the new york yankees came out after a, a pitcher got a he threw the ball the guy hit it and it was about 100 mile an hour hit him in the head and then the new york yankees came out and said yeah he had a mild concussion from it no he didn't he had a concussion it's not mild. There's no bell ringer. There's no now. There's different grades, but that's not that's not up to me to decide that. That's up that's up to a, a medical professional to make that and, and to say that it's a mild concussion or it's it's not taking it seriously. I mean, come on, 110 mile an hour ball off the off, off the noggin, you may, uh, but chances are there's some there's there's going to be some some consequences of that. So it's 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 and and the Concussion Legacy Foundation in the U.S. You know, took them to task. Said, "Hey, take that back. That's not that's not the proper proper language that we should be using when discussing head injury." So that's just you, an example. Even at uh, the professional level, like the MLB, the NBA, the NHL, um, the trainer that are there. There are some doctors I know uh, that are always available, but I kind of like find it really hard to find um, to have a diagnostic. Um, like five minutes or 10 minutes after or during a game and the guy, the player come back on the ice or uh, playing baseball or whatever and with a diagnostic, oh, he had a mild concussion. I kind of agree with you. It's kind of like, um, I don't know, I'm really skeptical on that. I'm like, yeah, did he? Or you just need him to finish the game. Like there is a big difference here. Like, Well, I, I think, I think too, um, and I believe as, as, as humans, every single knock in the head doesn't mean that you have to stop playing. I mean, that, again, that's not up to me to decide. That's not for the coach to decide. That, that's a medical assessment. Um, I think we're designed to take some knocks in the head, okay? But I think some of the things that we're going to get into talking about, and, and Adrian's probably better at talking about it than this time, but the science behind it, and uh, it, it's, it used to be that we were always just concerned about that big knock in the head, that concussion. But it's not the science is now proving no, 
that it's it's the it's the repeated blows to the head that end up adding up. And I would like to also add that um, men, especially, underreport mental health and concussions. I know that. So they're going to underreport. So using things like, well, they're not being reported, depends on the questions you ask. If you say, have you had a concussion? Most men, um, I'm speaking from a male perspective, will say, no, nope, I'm good to go. But if you said, ask more specific questions, right? And, and, and said, hey, look, um, okay, have you had this symptom? Have you had this symptom? And they're saying yes to all of them while they've had a concussion. So it depends on the question that you ask as well. Um, so I think there's a relationship there. Um, uh, again, this advocacy and talking about it and where the science meets the reality. Uh, because in the military, you know, in football, there's a blue tent on the sideline. You go, you go in the blue tent. There's no blue tent in Afghanistan. You know, you take a shot, you get up, you keep going. And there's, there are plenty of examples of soldiers being in hospital and going AWOL from the hospital to get back to their unit. So to tell a soldier, you know, it's, it's, it's a different, it's a different animal you're dealing with the military. There's, there's a, there's a, a different perspective. Um, it's a good conversation to have because you know someone that does get maybe a knock in the head they, they they we don't want them to be afraid to report it because then if they're going to be sent back um out of combat with their comrades is they they, they then, then they won't report it as well so, yeah so it's a, it's a fine line yeah yeah that's an interesting uh point that you're bringing there because actually um let me just send oops that's not what I wanted to do. Let me just uh, start a poll here. I would like to know uh, amongst our people here who had um, a concussion. So if you did have a concussion, just uh, say yes. And if you had a multiple ones, uh, just say yes on the second one. And I want to see like uh, how often it is happening. And maybe if you say never, that doesn't mean you never had one. It's just... Maybe. This is the question yeah. that I don't like. This is yeah. the exact question I don't like. It's, it's, it's asking more specific questions about, because we don't know, I mean, as an athlete, I don't, I don't necessarily know what a concussion is. Yeah. And if I think that a concussion is only get it because I get knocked out or I, I, you know, well then that's, that's uh, misleading. It's, it's, uh, and that's the thing, right? Is that in populations such as athletes or military, well, a lot of the times that threshold, that pain threshold, and especially when we have adrenaline going and things like that, we won't identify a blow as what it was. Often it was just, oh, well, you know, I got knocked or I got rocked or whatever. And you just, you stand up again and you're on your way. And that's where other people seeing it becomes important because other people can actually see how hard it was. Whereas while you're living it, you might, you might diminish how hard it was just because you were in the moment and you know you were focused on other things right so that's yeah. where these multiple components of people helping the one who's getting the concussion or getting the hit people helping them realize it right and recognize it and if you've had if you played contact most a lot a lot of uh soldiers in the military played sports before joining you know quite a few and and, and still play sports in there um, and if you played uh, contact sports um, and say that you've just had one concussion, I don't believe you. I mean, it's, it's, it's up until now and still now, because I coached football recently in Quebec, and still now people are targeting the head. Yeah. And I see people just getting, and I mean, it's, it's serious. I mean, it's, it's a very serious thing to target someone's head. Uh, police officers are not allowed to target your head unless unless there's grounds to use deadly force it's very serious it's a very serious thing and so if we're telling our kids that yeah it's okay to do that um yes i know boxing is different mma is a, a bit different because you're both expecting that but to specifically target the head for instance in football um you know i i see i see young athletes all the time uh you know targeting certain areas like say targeting the head and missing the tackle because it's not the right way to tackle. Uh, you go yeah. target in the head. Once you get to higher levels, you go target. I mean, they'll just they'll just deke you out and keep going. It's not just you know beyond not being healthy. It's, it's just not good technique either. Um, 
So, you know, that's just a comment on people saying, well, yeah, I've had one concussion. Mm -hmm. Like, okay. Um, you know, more specific uh, questions and, and all of a sudden, yeah, maybe I've had more than one. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, uh, just for our audience, like just to know what is a concussion for them, it's not only a concussion that is an injury. There's more than that. Um, Adrian, you might uh, explain that a little bit later, but a concussion is when uh, you lose consciousness and you do have some red flags after, but, um, and then um, there's a brain injury. So what, what's happening? It's inside your cranial. You got your brain and your brain has nowhere else to go. So when a blow comes to your head or any impact, you can also have a whiplash that will squish your, your brain inside the skull because there's no absorption happening inside. So that is why we uh, are having these kind of injuries, just because the way we are made up, um, we are creating the injury itself when we're playing some uh, sports. But even like in the military with studies that are showing that uh, when we are um, shooting really big gun, like a, a Gustav, a big bazooka for people who don't know what is a Gustav. Um, it's, it's the wave that the, the bazooka is creating can also damage your brain, can also create some TBI, some CTE, or even sure. a concussion. Being in, so. the turret, being in the turret, firing the 25 millimeter, being in the tank, being around artillery pieces going off. Um, even being an instructor on a range where there's uh, machine guns, like th these are all putting off percussions. Um, yeah. And like we talked about before, you know, it's these repeated and, 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 and it's about, it's about giving information because leaders ha in the military have to make decisions. They have to make decisions that aren't necessarily that fit like in, in the, in the real world. Um, they're, they're living in a bit of a different world. And so um, it's crucial that they have that information. So if someone jumps out of a plane, they're in, th they're in a, a light battalion and they jump out of a plane on Monday and they smack their head pretty good. Okay, they get up and they're assessed and they can keep going. On Wednesday, you're doing some pugil stick fighting. Is it a good idea that that person that just whacked their head go and do the pugil stick fighting? Yeah. If he's cleared, okay, okay. He's cleared medically, okay, good. Now they go do some pugil stick and he takes another shot in the head, okay. Now you've got some decisions to make. And, I, and I'm not accusing the military or anything, because when I took the close quarter battle instructor course, um, I took a pretty good shot in the head during pugil stick, and the instructor said, this was years ago, this is 2005. So I said, are you okay? I said, well, I blacked out for a second. He said, okay, you're done. That's it. So, you know, like there's, there's, there's you know, we're doing this. I know this is happening in the military. But yeah. It's to put it together at the command level and say, okay, it's different. I mean, it's different than rolling that ankle, right? Like, you know, it's, it's, it's different in the sense that those repeated blows and then say maybe on, on Friday or on the following Monday or say on the Friday of the same week, you got to go to the range and you're firing shoulder fired recoilless weapons that have a big signature or whatever, you know, that that's the kind of, of thinking uh, at the leadership level. And I don't mean necessarily just at the officer level, that's normally at the sergeant level because it's the sergeants that are looking after the grunt. Yeah troops right so it's it's that it's getting them to, to 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 buy into it and go i was talking to a sergeant from three rs three r who served in three rcr the other day he says yeah it totally makes sense so it's it's about you know really spreading that information and every, every making sure everybody has uh has that information and, and able to because you know the health of that soldier um you know we, we look after the person that rolls their ankle says okay well definitely they can't go on the march they rolled their ankle um but if there's anything we want intact and working well in a soldier is their brain, is the ability to make decisions and uh, complex decisions and tough and tough, stressful situations. And life threatening decision too. And, and life and life yeah. threatening decision. So um, it's not always about necessarily what happens, say, in Afghanistan. It's what leads up to like an MMA fighter. If an MMA fighter is going to be fighting in six months, they don't want to be taking shots in the head every you know all the way up to they're gonna have to fight at full speed uh but they're in the fight world they're a lot more cognizant of it as well about uh, about overall uh, shots to the head yeah so this is what um, is really interesting for me adrian i, I think you you're going to be able to uh, answer a little bit more that question but like um you can see some animals that are designed to have impact to the heads like uh uh, a bull 
like actually our uh, a big horn ram or also uh, like a wood a woodpecker who's like using his head to drill a hole inside a tree um i know that the design of the brain of an animal is made for him for absorbing the impact what i was reading on the internet was the woodpecker can absorb 99.7 percent of the impact every time he hits the the, the tree which is kind of impressive it's not even uh, going into his brain but the question is more like why does a human brain is incapable of doing this why is it impossible can you enlighten us on that yeah and so one thing that actually you touched upon that's interesting to note here is that concussions don't necessarily you don't necessarily need to black out to have a concussion and you don't need to be hit by something to have a concussion right so it comes from a direct or an indirect okay. force and so if you think of these animals for example that's an example of a direct force like they're hitting something they're hitting something repetitively but realistically so that's you know <coughs> that's pretty obvious what's happening in terms of humans if we think of all the different ways that we could you know directly or indirectly have a force that causes basically our brain as you said so if our brains covered by our skull to hit our skull and come back that's the impact that we care about right it's not something hitting our head it's actually the brain moving in our skull and hitting our skull or rotating around in our skull that's really important and so that's an intrinsic factor right so there's basically a lot of different things that come into play when we talk about brain injuries and so every animal for example is very different because I mean they look different right and that's an intrinsic difference you know a bull is different than a woodpecker is different than us humans and so you know woodpeckers have certain mechanisms in their physiology so how they're made that protect them from that back and forth movement of their brain hitting their skull and so they have different structures uh, in their face in their neck in their in their skull that basically keep the brain from moving and having that basically effect against the skull and humans you know we're just not anatomically made to be able to handle those types of impacts and that's just that's just human nature that's our physiology you know our spine is not enormous compared to our body our necks and for example you look at a, a woman's neck and a male's neck or you know if you want to go even more extreme you know a 10 year old girl's neck and a 25 year old football player's neck the girth is quite different right and so that alone could be a protective mechanism right and so there's all, all of these things that come into play when a uh, a concussion happens where you could either increase your risk of having one or decrease it just based off of your physiology hmm. Well, it's good for sure. So, um, Ryan, I guess my question's for you. Um, so, did you have any traumatic brain injuries in, in your football career? Well, if you were to ask me that, then I'd say no. Um, so, certainly, I mean, I, you know, now knowing what I know, um, you know, uh, it happened to me in high school, it happened to me in university, and, and in professional, where... Um, I now know that they were concussions and you're not going to lie to you. Sometimes I just shook it off and kept going. And, uh, I think there was only, there was only one time where I couldn't shake it off because I got knocked out. Um, so that's, you know, and not just football. I mean, now I, now that I know I, I experienced plenty while in the military as well. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I've taken a few shots. Hmm. Crazy. And how about you, Adrian? You mentioned uh, that uh, you had a career-ending uh, concussion with hockey. Uh, was was it a, a hit injury, or what happened there? Yeah, I mean, I was a a, a person who loved all of the extreme and uh, contact sports, so those were always a good mix for head injuries. Um, and with hockey, I mean, hockey's a very well, at that level especially, there's a lot of contact and uh, 
one too many hits. I, I had quite a few concussions, and the last one was just a little bit too much. <laughs> For sure. So wh what were your guys' recoveries like? Is there anything you remember specifically from that time period? or? Well, I remember it was nothing. Just rest. Just okay. uh, don't do anything. Um, I, I remember at one time that I had to do something, so I started reading, you know, and um, I would get, you know, sometimes you read and then you forget what you read. You're like, you're thinking about something else that happens to all of us. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that just kept happening and happening and happening. And then, so because of that, when I went back, they said, well, you think you can play this week? Because we, we did an MRI and you're, you're, you're good to go, right? And I said, well, okay. But then I told them about the reading and the doctor said, oh, okay, no, maybe you're not good to go. So they, I mean, they really either knew and didn't tell me because, yeah, you know, you have to understand it professional sports is a business so if I don't play mm -hmm. someone else has to play and they need to pay me and they mm -hmm. need to pay that person so mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not saying there's a conspiracy there but we, uh, the research and the information on on the severity uh, just wasn't around then. Um, okay. but I was glad that I did that and that happened to my son recently he whacked mm -hmm. his head pretty good and I brought him to the hospital and they and they said well just wait because I knew um, if there's something that was going to happen it would happen within the first few hours of him whacking his head like that. Um, and after a while, I got him to play a math game. Mm. And when he first started, he was a bit wobbly. And then after a while, because it kept his, his stats, he was right back to where he was. So I went to the nurse and I said, look, I, he, he was, you know, when he first started, he was a bit wobbly. And now he's kind of right back to where his normal standard was. And the, and the nurse said, okay, look, that's good. Um, it had been three or four hours. I said, okay, well, he's probably good to go home so um <laughs> i'll let adrian talk more about that because I, I you know that's just me kind of doing something instinctively knowing that you know same with a, a, any other type of acute injury the faster you can kind of get moving um you know, i had the same thing when i hurt my back at one time You're like yeah don't do anything don't do anything don't i'm like can't in a month i gotta do something mm -hmm. so uh i think there there there, there was that go-to back then for a lot of doctors and business they don't don't do anything but mm -hmm. we know that that's short-sighted for sure yeah, I've heard some horror stories about kids that were like stuck in the rest phase and like missing school for over a year because everything brought on their symptoms and they didn't really know how to get them out of that. And that, that's really devastating too. I mean, that can be just as devastating as not resting really. It's kind of one extreme to the other for sure. Right. And you throw a stigma in there. And you yeah, throw for sure. Throw depression. Yep. Same with my veteran advocacy, veterans getting stuck. They're stuck at home because mm -hmm. it's just a bad cycle. Uh, for sure. Seeing the same thing. With head injury, we're seeing this very similar mental health uh, issues that are that are popping mm -hmm. up. So, um, for sure, certainly advocacy is going to is going to help that a lot to say, "Hey, speak up! You're not alone." Um, mm -hmm. There's other people that are experiencing this as well. For sure. And how about you, Adrian? What was your experience like in terms of your symptoms and what you struggled to to come back from? It's actually really interesting because, um, you know, for me, it was likely a little bit more recent um, just from the sounds of how our, our recoveries both went. But for me, uh, I'm still recovering and I'm still actively seeking out um, treatment for other side effects that happened after that last concussion. And it's been five years now. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially there's a big discrepancy between those who do continuing education. So practitioners and medical practitioners that do continuing education and keep and stay on top of the latest and greatest with concussion mm -hmm. and those who are still stuck in that all we can do is rest and it's really challenging and so basically it was when I was navigating my own injury and my own rehab that I realized that there was a massive gap in in knowledge amongst practitioners as to what to do but mm -hmm. also in terms of telling patients what they can do and and knowing where to guide them right mm -hmm. and that's what kind of led me to study in this field because at the present state depending on where you go and who you see you might have a night and day approach because more and more we're starting to have active recovery protocols and mm -hmm. so there's slowly becoming more targeted rehabilitation approaches so 
you know, as Ryan was saying, sometimes it's good to stimulate our bodies mm -hmm. and sometimes it's good to stimulate our recovery. But for a long time, because it's invisible, because we can't see what's wrong, people didn't want to do anything, right? You, mm -hmm. It was just, it was rest, it was the dark room, it was dungeon. And essentially what comes along with dungeon is a lot, a lot mm -hmm. of mental health issues, right? But also mm -hmm. physiological ones, because we're just mm -hmm, not doing sure. it. And so now the way that science is advancing and you know, hopefully it starts spreading to more and more people that are working in the medical fields is that, you know, there's a lot more we can do. And, you know, it's not black and white and it's not, uh, you know, it's still a bit of a black hole, but there's, there's slowly becoming more active things and constructive ways that we can approach our rehab. But, you know, as a physio or as an MD or as you know, an occupational therapist, whoever, it's important to be learning about these because, you know, the field of concussion is is behind and it was behind. And so now, finally, we're getting all this information and people need to make sure to learn it so that they mm -hmm. can share it with their patients, right? Mm -hmm. No, for sure. Well, I, yeah, I remember when I was in physio school, there was really no such thing as physiotherapy for concussions, you know, and now it's a whole little niche unto its own, for sure. So no, I think we have, we're moving the right direction, at least, although well, there's miles to go, for sure. So Ryan, um, in terms of like procedures and protocols in the 90s in the CFL, um, so what were they doing when a, uh, with, their, with the players with suspected concussions compared to now? How much has that changed? Um, well... I think it's changed. I mean, it's come full circle. I mean, it's um, there's now protocols put in place. Um, if if my memory serves me correctly, correctly, um, you know, uh, I was too busy playing the games, and and you know the, that was a physiotherapist that was to, would take a player. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it was kind of a joke. It was kind of funny. Maybe it's not that funny, but we all made fun of it. Is that they would hide the player's helmet if they were not to go back into the game, and then the player would can, would be coming around asking everybody, hey, have you seen my helmet? Hey, have you seen my helmet? Then you knew that, okay, that person's got a concussion. They're not going back in the game. Um, <laughs> so I don't, I mean, it just wasn't <coughs> talked about. We called them ringers. We called them, oh, I got my bell rung. We called, we called them everything but what they were. Um, and again, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not pointing the finger at anyone. We, we knew what we knew at the time. And, and, um, in order to make it in professional sports, you need to be tough. You mm -hmm. absolutely need to be tough physically. Um, you, you're only going to make the team if you can play through injury. I mean, I, I played through with broken bones. I played with torn ligaments. Um, I played with a cracked vertebrae in my neck. I took it at the time. <laughs> Found out that years later. Uh, and played with head injury. Mm -hmm. So, and and you you are not going to get a young athlete. Um, young athletes that make it to that level, they get there because they have probably a high tolerance for pain, like Adrian talked about earlier, and they're driven and they're tough physically. So mm -hmm. it's not their responsibility. There, there's partly their responsibility. It's now a medical professional's responsibility mm -hmm. to say, no, you're done. You cannot. And medical professionals have a lot of power. They have a lot of authority to say, no, you're, you're not going back in the game. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you, the coach sends you back in the game, then the coach is probably going to get in trouble. So there's there's more of that because of what happened in the states, because the concussion legacy found in the day, foundation in the states took the NFL to task uh, because they, you know, the NFL was denying um, that this was a problem. So um, because litigation, it had it was a problem, but that's been, you know, had gotten a lot of publicity in the states. And I don't think we run into the same uh, litigation problems in Canada, but we still run into some of the same attitudes. Mm -hmm. um, however, we just had a talk with uh, football Saskatchewan. I forget the gentleman's name, and it was a breath of fresh air. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it, it was they're doing everything that they can, you know, obviously with COVID going on, but they understand head injury. They understand the importance of skill. Mm -hmm. It takes an incredible amount of skill to, to, to play football. It takes an incredible amount of skill to play hockey and basketball. 
you can be working on all these things without getting smacked in the head. It's like trying to learn to play the guitar and every once in a while someone's going to come up and smack you in the head. It makes about as much sense right? mm -hmm. because a developing athlete needs to focus and work on skill. And some mm -hmm. athletes, they're a little more afraid when they're younger and they're a little more intimidated and they sometimes grow out of that. But they're missing that opportunity if the only focus is on collisions and the big hit and the and things like that, which have been perpetuated in the past by professional sports, you know, the big hit tapes and the big hit parade. And mm -hmm. you're seeing that less and less. You're seeing, you know, because they're going to get sued if they do that, because we know now that that's, that's a problem. So in that linear. Sure. And how about the military culture around concussion? Um, as we mentioned before, uh, Ryan was an infantry officer with the RCR, for yes. people who tuned in a little bit late. Well, um, I think, again, you know, we knew what we knew at the time. Um, I, I didn't think about it. I didn't think about when I was firing a weapon. The effects on my head. I, didn't, I didn't think about it because I had a job to do. We had a job. Mm -hmm. And I mean, as an officer, I'm, I'm not firing weapons all the time. I'm firing some of these weapons to be familiar with them. Um, but it's the soldiers that are doing that nonstop. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that are taking the shots. And, you know, as, as, a, as a leader, I'm still a leader, and I, and I, I want to make sure that we understand where this is going because we need we need to protect our, our soldiers uh, not only when they're in but also to have this understanding that when they do leave you know they may have they may have some 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 head injuries uh that they that they may need to some support uh getting through uh mm -hmm. so i think uh well, like one of the examples i gave earlier is when i took a shot during pewter stick fighting mm -hmm. and uh, it was obvious i'd taken a pretty good shot and the instructor said you okay and i said well i, I I was ready to go again, but I said, well, I kind of blacked out a bit. And he said, no, you're done. That's it. So, Good. yeah, I mean, it, and that was in 2005. So mm -hmm. I think there's more of a common sense in the military. There's more of a, okay, wait a second. That, that's, you know, because we really are um, looking after uh, each other. But again, the understanding of, you know, someone that takes a good shot in the knee or, you know, gets a good bruise, they're just going to rub it and keep going. And with a head injury, we might say, okay, wait a second here. Let's just, you know, in training, because it is training, let's maybe take a step back and, and, and have uh, a medical uh, professional look at mm -hmm. that because it's, because it's the right thing to do. Awesome. Well, thank you. I'm going to pass you guys back to Francis here. If I can figure out how to do it. Um, <clears throat> also, what you can you hear me? Yeah. Also, what you brought up uh, just earlier, you were saying that even when you're under 18 year old and you're you're playing like you, you brought up like a really good point. So the question is for both of you guys. But what's your opinion about there's some uh, neuropathologists or doctors that are uh, promoting to have no contact sports before the age of 18? Like you've probably heard of that in the news. Uh, they don't want to promote that hockey. They want to like erase the, the physical contact uh, before, if I'm correct, it's midget. Um, and w what's your opinion about that? Like, are you agreeing on that kind of stuff, or you want to you want them to focus on the skills of the game and not the the big physical impact? I can answer from a kind of player's perspective slash coach perspective. And I think Adrian can answer kind of from both sides. So I, I, I said it earlier, I, I believe that, yes, I don't know what the age is. Um, I think, you know, can let professionals decide that, not the coaches. Um, but I, I think there's enough skill to work on. Uh, you can still put the pads on in football um, and, and, you know, some of the, the, the youth organizations have all the pads on and they have flags and you still have to be in a good position to be able to get that flag. But again, do you know how hard it is for young athletes to get the snap from center and hand the ball off? It looks easy. It's not, it's a skill. Snap the ball, field goal. It's a skill. Snap the ball, quarterback takes a three-step drop. The, the, the receiver has to run a pattern based on that three-step drop, timing, throw the ball and catch the ball. That's all skill. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, doesn't necessarily need, yes, you should be teaching proper forms of tackling, which some organizations are bringing rugby players in to do. 
because you're not using your head in rugby. If you do, you're going to, I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> I played rugby. You don't use your head like you do. Um, no. And I know, I know there's talk all the time about, well, rugby's harder because, you know, there's no equipment. Well, let me tell you, equipment, the higher you go up, is used as a weapon. It's not, it's a weapon. And you put your forehead on someone's wrist. We did it. We put your forehead on someone's forearm to try to get the ball out. Um, and so when you start getting the, the head out of it, um, then it's, it's, it's no longer a weapon and, and you're no longer thinking of using it as a weapon uh, because sports are competitive and you want to win. And if you can get that ball out by putting your mask on the person's finger, uh, you know, but if, if, if everyone's preaching, no, 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 let's, let's get that out of the game and let's, let, let's, let's teach a different way to tackle. You can still teach all those things. So by the time they're ready, and like Adrian said before, not only there's that, but there's the physical, like, have you seen 14? Like, you're, the one looks like an adult. The other yeah. one looks like they're 10. I mean, it, it, it doesn't, they, they need to, they, they need to, you know, re, proper resistance training. They can build their necks with exercise balls. They can build their yoke with squatting and deadlifting and make sure their spines are strong enough. Um, and, you know, so I, I, I think I'm pretty clear on my son, my perspective. On I played uh... my son. My son won't. I mean, he won't. I, I won't put him in football right now. No way. No way. I, I've been there. I've coached. I've seen what, what what's happening. No, I won't. He'll play basketball. He'll do other skills. I throw the football around with him. He loves it. We're having a lot of fun. He doesn't like contact. Yeah. He doesn't like it. He says, I don't want to do that. Uh, that might change when he's a bit older. Um, so... You know, that's my perspective on, on skill and development. As you mentioned, I've played uh, university rugby university, and um, <clears throat> people were saying that it's more rough than football. I totally agree with you. It's not just because they're saying that we don't have equipment. Well, that is the point. You don't have an equipment, so you don't have a protection. And when a person hits you, um, you feel it. You literally feel it because it's literally bone to bone. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't agree with that. I think that even... It's a rough sport. I'm not saying it's not a rough sport. I had like multiple injuries in, in rugby, but it's literally uh, for concussion. We're not going to do a head to head contact. Obviously, we're not going to be. Um, no, but, but for that. example, and I'm not trying to steal on <clears throat> Adrian jump in here, but um, for example, in rugby, you know, you can, you know, the scrums can be pretty rough, hard on the neck, hard on the head. So you can, you, if, if people in rugby know that, then maybe you kind of save that contact for the games when they're older, but you teach the skill of a scrum. You teach it because it's a skill set that you have to learn. Um, all the while building the muscles necessary to, to be able to withstand some of those impacts. Yeah, so Adrian, like it's uh, kind of interesting. What's your uh, opinion about that? And I know like, yeah, you've played hockey, women's hockey, it's different than men's hockey, but um, it doesn't really save you from that kind of injury. No, not at all. And I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a double-edged sword because some people think that concussions happen more in competitive contact sports, <clears throat> you know, that people playing recreational level are safe. But it's actually interesting, and that's where learning the skill and learning the tactics actually comes as a preventative mechanism. Because, yes, the forces that people kind of suffer at a competitive level are greater because people are stronger, they're faster, they hit harder, the equipment's harder. Um, there's all those factors. But then in rec sports or in rec activities, often people don't know how to take a hit. They don't know how to give a hit. They might not have the proper equipment. And so there's a bit of both happening, right? And so it's important to really, I think, establish how the game should be played, right? And that's where that foundation of the skills of the game and the purpose of the game and how each game should be played really needs to be ingrained in the individual. And I know a couple of the questions that were coming up on the side were about, you know, well, how do we change that mentality? How do we change that macho mentality? And I was starting to write, but, you know, there's no way to write it because it's essentially about changing a culture. And changing a culture takes many years, it takes a lot of effort, and it takes buy-in from all the parties, right? So it takes buy-in from the teammates, 
it takes buy-in from the celebrities it takes buy-in from the mentors so you know uh every most famous person in each sport well are they showing an aggressive behavior or are they showing you know skill and finesse and what are we praising as reporters and as media people are we you know hooing and hawing every time somebody gets hit or are we sounding concerned and saving the positive reinforcement for when goals are scored right and so there's so many components that have to go into changing this culture but I think at the end of the day sports aren't meant to be vicious and mean yes there's contact in a lot of sports but often we've created that um, that danger just through what we've reinforced you know we've potentially if you're in a macho group of of people while well, they're reinforcing an aggressive behavior instead of reinforcing you know yes finishing your hit but doing it in the proper manner so I think it's it's just about changing the messaging whether you're a coach a teammate a media reporter uh, you know a skills uh, coach anything it's, it can it's, come from many sources you're seeing professional sports you see in the NHL you see in the NFL they're cracking down. Like some people are getting tossed, you know, third, third, uh, head con like, uh, targeting the head out for the season, massive fines. I mean, it's, it's, this isn't, this is again, like the smoking industry, this isn't going to stop. The science is only going to catch up. This is not going away. So if you're one of those people that, uh, you, you, you want to still, you want to be macho, you want to be tough, go box, go do MMA. Uh, there's there's some pretty tough people in that and you might you might think twice about it um but sports like football sports like hockey are saying no the game is good football's a great game hockey's a great game um let's take you know these when you finish your professional career let's say you played until you're 40 you had a lot of years left a lot of years left and mm -hmm. when young athletes are deeply involved in their sport it's not their responsibility yes we, we they have a responsibility but this is a leadership responsibility this is owners these are are, are people that are in charge of the league uh, they're the ones that are in charge of protecting them um, but you, you're also seeing advocacy you know athletes ex-athletes current athletes like you've been saying that are advocating for this as well and these things take time I mean um, and any any change in culture, it does take time, but it's changing. It's already changing, and it's going to continue to evolve. What really amazed me right now is when you see MMA, uh, an MMA fight, or even a box fight, or something like that, and then you see that they are taking more care of the athletes during the match, seeing, okay, are you okay? And there's a doctor on the side, like there's a course specific course to become that kind of trainer on the side for these kind of sports but when you see hockey you see uh the board shaking uh people's taking videos and putting on youtube when they start a scrimmage or a fight on the ice and i don't feel that they are treated the same way we like the fights we like it to see violence yes uh football it's like violence without violence without fighting but we like to see that but i don't feel that we treat the player the same way as in a really uh, an environment focused on violence like boxing or mma so it's very interesting and you guys bring it's are bringing it up uh, that way do you think that there's other sports that people don't think that they have um or they could have a concussion but it can happen or does it have like a difference in gender or even like uh i don't know in different age group or something like that what's your thought about that Definitely. Um, there's definitely a lot of, and that's those risk factors coming into play, right? So, you know, very common uh, factors that come in are age or, um, you know, are you a male or are you a female? Um, so, as I said with the example previously, often, you know, you'll take the different physiologies. So, how a person who looks really muscular and really built, well, when you hit them, if you look at their head, their head probably won't wobble like this. But if you look at, you know, a young child <coughs> who doesn't necessarily have the same muscular structure, well, you might hit them at that same 
speed or force and there will be quite a lot of movement in the neck and head area and then that'll cause that again brain hitting the skull effect right and so um that's a big one but then also there's there are a lot of changes that happen in our brains as we as we develop so you know along childhood there's tons of different um, developments that happen in our brain and in the rest of our physiology so there's a there's quite a few risk factors that are being continually studied, but then there's also those ones that are pretty well known as well. Well, there's, there's you know, soccer um, is not brought up a lot, but um, heading the ball, a lot, a, a lot of organizations are getting rid of that or they're using sponge balls or something to teach the skill, but mm -hmm. to get away from that impact. And there's a really good uh, video from a, a female soccer player, uh, world-class Olympian, um, and it shows how many concussions she got playing soccer. I mean, you know, going up to head the ball in competition and, and clacking heads with another player. I mean, numerous times she had concussions. So you think, well, it's not a problem in soccer. No, well, it definitely can be a problem uh, in soccer. So uh, I know some organizations in Canada are on board with the Concussion Legacy Foundation. And I think more are, are going to once the, you know, they realize that it's those repetitive lows. Um, and like I said, you teach the skill, and if it happens in a game, I don't think it happens necessarily all the time, but I mean, there there is a certain amount of risk, again, back to the smoking. Now you go to get a pack of cigarettes, I don't smoke, but there's a sign of like someone's lung on it or something. Well, you know, people are gonna know that, hey, if your son plays football, or your daughter plays football, or plays soccer, there, there are certain risks associated with head injury. Mm -hmm. And that's all. It's, it's making, it's awareness. It's making people aware of that. And so some parent that maybe sees that and they see, they go to soccer practice and their young kid is heading the ball 50 times. They might go, well, wait a second. Um, I don't want to talk to the coach about this because I, I'm not sure if this is a good idea. So it's bringing that awareness up and, and also <clears throat> where to find those resources is important as well. I'm mm -hmm. sure, you know, the internet's like this. So I think we have about five minutes left. So instead of us keeping asking you guys questions, we're just wondering if there's any questions from anyone else. Um, I'm not sure if you want to type it or come in. You can kick me out of here if there's too many of us on the webcam. Yeah, if you guys so want to jump in, I just saw let us know. Oh. That I wasn't able to um, to address writing was the the question of how do we, you know, how do we teach people about concussions and you know if it's a young male adolescent versus an elderly person versus an adult you know how do we make that message stick and I think the biggest thing is speaking their language right so we need to we need to bring it to them in a way that they'll understand so if you're talking to a group of athletes who are kind of in that macho phase of their life well we need to give them examples tangible examples of things that they care about that could be affected by concussion and, you know, if you're talking to a more elderly person, well, you're not going to be showing them clips of, of a, an NFL or hitting another guy. You're going to be showing them clips of, you know, an elderly person falling and, and mm -hmm. showing them the importance of that's why they need to put, you know, a carpet on their steps or something like that. So you, you speak a language that they, can, that they can touch, you know. It has to be mm -hmm. a tangible message for them. Mm -hmm. What's your uh, opinion, uh, Ryan, for the military? Like, what would be your, because um, we had a question about in the military, how can we be more preventive? Well, we're going to be more aware. Uh, there, there, there's there's um, an awareness campaign that we're working on right now. So it starts with that. Uh, the other campaign that we're hopefully going to launch this year is called Project Enlist. We need military members. And there, there, there's a gender gap in brain donations. We need female brain donations as much as we need male brain donations, because out of the 100 plus military brains that they studied in the States, close to 70% uh, veteran brains had CTE. We need to find out why. Is that from military service? Is that from sport? Again, you know, we need veterans, current serving members to donate. Um, it's, it's, it's crucial that we, we advance this, uh, this uh, science and, and, and maybe there's, a, there's a, a correlation too between uh, the mental health challenges that shoulder, soldiers face uh, and, and head injury as well. And, and so it's making those connections. 
Uh, they can go on the right now if, if a soldier wants to donate or a veteran wants to donate, they can go on the Concussion Legacy Foundation uh, project and list, and it, it'll you can go and donate, tell you what country you're from. I mean, there's brain banks in New Zealand, the U.S. Um, we're working on a brain bank in Canada, so we don't have to go through the US, U.S. in case something happens, especially now because of the, the border. Uh, and we're hoping to close that deal um, this uh, this fall. So that's very important. So, so that's that's very interesting. We go on Concussion Foundation Legacy to go that. It might cut at any seconds. I'm sorry if it did, if, if it does. Um, but if not, like just go on Concussion uh, Foundation Legacy to get some more information from our two guests. I know Marty and Martin, Martin ask, uh, what is a CTE? It's a chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, I didn't say it right. Encephalopathy. <laughs> uh, it's uh, uh, an occurring uh, TBI, traumatic brain injury, or concussion. So. There's a lot to know about that subject. So if you guys didn't have a chance to watch the part one and part two, uh, go ahead. There's a lot of information on that too. But also if you do need some more information from these two experts right here, um, feel free to go on Concussion Legacy uh, uh, Foundation to get some more information. You can uh, get in touch with them. Like they said, uh, they do a lot of presentation everywhere they do also a lot of presentation with sports and military so we will see them again and also if you guys want some more another uh, podcast with them let us know like it's uh it's only stuck in an hour and we're like exceeding an hour right now but uh, yeah we can have them um another time if you guys are interested uh to hear more about her research for example or the experience the sports athlete experience or military experience that they had um, just before it cuts, I would like to thank you guys to come here and uh, talk with us. I saw that Adrienne just answer; uh, she's answer, answering a lot of questions in French. Um, so that's uh, that's awesome for the people who ask the questions. Yeah, and thanks guys for all your time. And uh, just, uh, just on a, on a note too that the Concussion Legacy Foundation is in the U.S. and in Canada. So if they want to approach in Canada, we also have a social media pre uh, presence. Um, and just make sure they go to the concussion legacy foundation.ca and uh, but we, we, we both organizations speak uh, there's also a hotline that's been developed so so with parents uh, maybe of children that are uh, or, or, or even uh, you know, we're, we're looking at pushing that into uh, to veterans as well so if there's because right now the challenge with head injury mental health recovery is there's no quarterback there's no it's, it's kind of and we're trying to be that quarterback to put people in touch with the proper resources so there's a helpline available as well that's awesome yeah definitely check that out yeah any last words adrian and uh, ryan before we uh we close that no thanks again thanks again guys um i hope we uh we've answered all the questions in the chat uh if we didn't uh just send an email to gm and i and uh, we will make sure to send it to these two people there so they can answer you guys uh, with no problem and thanks, and uh, hope to see you guys soon. If we, uh, if they want another podcast, we'll uh, be more than happy to hold another one for sure. Awesome. All right, guys. So uh, see you guys later, and uh, thanks for having you guys again. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.